gospel text for this Sunday is taken from John chapter 5 verses 1 through 9. After this, a Jewish festival took place and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of, dis of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got up, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now, that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews and the man who had been healed, I'm sorry, now that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. He replied, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. This is the gospel of the Lord. You, O Christ. <clears throat> Please be seated as we... Friends in Christ, grace and peace be to you. From our Father. Uh, as we go into the text, let's take a moment and and pray together. We ask, Lord, that you speak to us at this time regarding what you would like us to learn from your word. That you open up our minds and hearts to be able to understand increasingly your truth. The truth that, as we continue to grow in it, sets us free. And so may you be glorified in the teaching today. In this we pray in your name. Amen. Um, I was able to uh, take in, in Orlando, uh, an event called the Holy Land Experience. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I had not. But um, I discovered that... Um, the central part of Florida is uh, pretty much tourist central. There's Bush Gardens and Disney World and uh, Universal Studios and nestled in the midst of all that entertainment stuff is this place called the Holy Land Experience. The reason why I bring it up is because they have a model of the city of Jerusalem back in Jesus' time. And I did not know this, but the pool that this gentleman uh, was unable and eventually did not need to go into was a hundred feet deep. They had deep pools back then, primarily, or in many ways, so that um, if they were ever under attack, they would have a, a, a supply of water that they could withstand a siege. And uh, I found that interesting. When I, when I read this, I, I can't imagine a pool being a hundred feet deep, but it's in part why people needed help, not just to get into the pool, but someone to help them while they are in the pool receiving their healing. Whether it was a mineral springs of water, we're not sure. But that being said, the, 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 the focus that I'd like to draw our attention to today is on the word redemption. In Christian circles, we use it a lot. Well, yeah, we use it a lot. Uh, you are the redeemer of Israel. And really, redemption has everything to do with belonging. That's what redemption is about. Um, 
I got done reading a book on the plane back and forth called The Juvenilization of American Christianity. And it's a fascinating book. I've always been curious of the different dynamics and spirit. I'm curious as to why in any given church you may have 20 people or to 5,000 people. What's the difference? What's going on there? And this book helped me to get that. But the running theme that, that goes through all of it is this deep, 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 innate and created need to belong. You see it happen in Genesis chapter 1. It's not random, the different days and, and the order of the days and, and, and how they were formed. If you take a look at it very clearly, the purpose for each day and its successive progressive manifestation is so that on the sixth day, at the very final act of creating, God would create his crown jewel, human beings, and say, look at this beautiful, look at this creation. Look at it. I'm going to create an animal that bears my resemblance and my image so that everyone in the physical realm can see the invisible glory of who I am by looking into one another's eyes. And I will give them stewardship. Because, and I will empower them in this stewardship so that together we will reign and glorify this creation. And so there's this innate sense of belonging. We need to belong. How do we do it in a world that takes that truth and has been formed by the deceitful illusion that we don't belong and that we are required to somehow work for that belonging? Genesis 3, there is the great divorce. The heaven, the unseen realm, and the seen realm are now separate. Not forever. Not forever, but for a time being. And the redemption, the, the, the pain that comes from that separation is not only that we are separated from the unseen realm, from God and, and the, the very presence of God, but we begin to experience the painful consequences and the fracturing that results from that as we experience separation from one another. And so you see the very first sin, if you will, in chapter 4 is Cain killing his very own brother. But before that even happens, God is still involved in the belonging process. God does not remove himself. God is still reaching out. And so before Cain does anything, God has a little conversation with him. Hey, why are you so upset? You ever have a conversation with somebody when they're upset? That's a dangerous tread. Most people don't want, he's upset, just don't even talk to him. That's usually our, because our, our, who wants to talk with somebody that's upset? It's uncomfortable. But God does. And he says, so um, why, why your face down? Why is your face downcast? And then he gives him a little bit of insight. But before he does that, he asks him a question. The, the, the question itself is a part of redemption. You belong to me. We can talk about this. The same thing is happening here with a man that's, that's uh, on the mat. Do you want to get healed? That's a very interesting question. Why, you, if you went into a hospital today, whatever room you go into, would you ask that question? Well, do you want to get out of this hospital? What kind of a question? You know, I'd have to go back to seminary and take pastoral counseling 101 all over again. Fail, epic fail. But the question is the engagement that's part of belonging. See, the question itself, while it may feel odd, the fact that Jesus is talking to the person is the odd thing. That's what's odd. You don't talk to people that are ill like that. 
they are considered cursed. They are considered unclean. And he was unclean. They're separated from society. They don't belong. They do not belong. The question itself is the beginning process of belonging. You belong. It's something that is so innate. If we don't understand the, the biblical worldview, we resort, we resort to the physical to get that sense of belonging. When I, I, when I got a chance to visit Rich, um, like I said this last week in Tampa, and he stays in a pretty, pretty nice area of Tampa. But I've never gone to see his hometown where he, or his, his home where he grew up. And he's like, well, you know, we can't go tonight because it's dark. And I don't think you'd feel safe there. All right. So the next day we went to his, his, his place and yeah, that's an interesting part of town. And uh, yeah, probably wouldn't be all that safe. I don't know if I'd be concerned about it. But his neighbor that had been, that had raised him since he was in junior high um, was there and I got to meet her and it was a wonderful experience. And so we laughed and, uh, and got to see a little bit of his childhood and where he grew up. And then we drove by this Catholic school, Jesuit high school. And he said, that's where I went to high school. I said, wait a second, you grew up in this neighborhood. And you, yeah, my mom made sure that I had a good education. So I was one of seven black kids from this neighborhood that went, I went to mass every day. Not knowing that down the road as a chaplain, I would be able to minister to so many different people. And he began to, to understand that the belonging transcends the limitations of the natural human being to a greater understanding that can only come from the reality of a biblical worldview of God. It's an amazing experience in terms of that, that sense of belonging that goes that deep. And so here we have Jesus speaking to a man, which is the first reaching out. You belong. And then it's an interesting conversation that takes place. Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, meaning into the pool, someone goes down ahead of me. He gives him, he gives him his background, his, his history. It's a wonderful way of the continuation of talking. It's simple, it's profound, and yet in that culture, this conversation should never have taken place. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe you didn't hear me. I'm disabled. Did you not hear me? I can't. Don't you think I would have already done this had I had the power to do this? It's an interesting command. You don't tell the blind person, oh, look at this. You can't see I'm blind? But that's exactly what Jesus does. Many times when he heals, he does something that they are absolutely incapable of doing. Get up. You can't see I've been disabled for a very long time. This is how grace works. Because grace is the power of God working on our behalf to do what we cannot do. And grace is what empowers us to move in, line, in alignment with redemption. So he gets up. Does no longer need to go into the pool to receive healing. He now completely belongs. Now... He's got to go. Need to go a little bit. Pick up your mat and walk. After this, Jesus found him in the temple. 
Yeah. Let me just back up a second. We cut, we cut and paste. I, I, I hate to cut and paste. We do it because it's our tradition, and there's, there's a meaning behind it, but sometimes you have to go beyond it. Instantly, the man got well picked up as man started to walk. Now, that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. You weren't Forget the healing part. You weren't supposed to walk around with a mat. You're doing work. And I don't have time to get into it uh, in terms of the, the, the degree of intensity and zealousness that they, that they brought to the law, primarily because of their history of, of experiencing the consequences when they completely ignored the law. Nonetheless, they ask him, who is this man who told you, who told you to do it, to told you to break the law? You see, it's a one thing if you're a law breaker. It's another thing if you're teaching other people to break the law. That's another thing. We want to know who told you to break the law. We can forgive you. You're okay. But who's the one that's teaching you against this? So they get into this conversation. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple. Now, you miss it. People aren't allowed, if you're disabled, to go into the temple. It's off limits to cripples. It's off limits to people that are unclean. You're not allowed to go in there. So the only way that he was allowed to go in there was to wash himself and to present himself as clean before a priest so that they would give him access into the temple. The other side of the temple is where they would have these deep pools in which one who had been cleansed, whether they touched something unclean, whether it was a sickness, whatever the case may be, they would go into these pools, fully clothed, dip their entire body into the pool, come out of the pool, and present themselves to the priest, and then if the priest okayed it, they could go into the temple. They went into the water, they got cleansed as a, as a sign of their cleansed, uh, being cleansed, and then came out. That's why John started using baptism as a sign of the coming kingdom, because everybody now, through the baptism, through Christ, was able to go into the temple and to experience the sense of belonging to the living God. Make sense? Did you know that before? Good. There's something new. That's my goal. So now he's in the temple, which means he has given testimony publicly to how he has been healed and that God has healed him. And now they, they can't let it go. So this is key because the sense of belonging is the ultimate redemption that the church brings forward. As I read in this book, it was, there was two things that, that, that caught my eye or caught my attention. A number of things, actually, but two things that stuck out. Since the 1950s, the, the, the church in general has placed a great deal of emphasis on youth. Because they're the future of the church, right? If you don't have youth, you don't live. Right? How, how are we doing with that? Eh, okay. But, but mainline denominations, for the, long, for, the, for, the, for the most part, did not put it. Evangelicals threw a ton of energy into it. Young Life Pair Ministries. But what was interesting about this, and I don't have a judgment on it because God uses everything. What's interesting about that is that when you take a look at what's currently the manifestation of that, is that one of the, one of the, the needs unbeknownst to the people at the time is that the new movement gave them a sense of belonging. Hey, they're playing my music. Not this old boring stuff. I belong. My friends are there. Regardless if it's mature or immature, there was a sense of belonging. You don't just get a sense of belonging in your 20s or 30s. You get it from the day you're born. You need to belong. So whether you address the adolescent need to belong or not, it's still a need to belong. And what's profound about it now is as, there, as this, the studies are showing when they interview people, most people that are in churches now are very, very biblical illiterate. In fact, in, in the 1950s, they did a poll of youth, of youth ministry and the majority of kids enjoyed their youth uh, ministry, enjoyed their youth gatherings, enjoyed their youth 
programs because it gave them a sense of belonging and, and, and it met their emotional needs, if you will. But n the majority now, which is 51% or more, could not name one of the four gospel books. But that's okay in terms of this dynamic because they're getting their needs met. You got you to mature, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying the need to belong is great. And so when Jesus is ministering, he is, he is enacting this ultimate reality of redemption where everything will belong as it was intended in Genesis 1. Bob just read Revelation chapter 21 going into chapter 22. It's the fulfillment where heaven and earth and all of us belong again the way we were intended. The new Jerusalem, we don't go up to heaven. The new Jerusalem comes to earth as the earth is recreated. There is no more death. There is no more disease. And the nations are no longer in war with one another. They are glorifying God and working together as one. There is a sense of belonging. And that inauguration of the resurrection reality in which everything belongs started when Jesus came out of the tomb. That's the initiation of this new reality. I was a little, little um, shocked by that in terms of going to the Holy Land. They had these three different presentations building up to the, to the resurrection. And at the very end of it all, there was Jesus in the clouds and uh, in his resurrected self and, and, and the, the music was just spectacular. And here was the various Christians that have died and martyred him coming to meet him. And it was this huge crescendo, was, you know, TBN as it, that is TBN's, you know, glorious uh, presentation. And then the curtain came down. And I'm like, they all went to be home with God. Ever heard that phrase? I want to go home to be with God. That's not your home. That's your temporary home. This your home. What? It's in the Bible. I'm not making it up. We've forgotten it. And so when the curtain came down, I'm like, what about the resurrection? What do you mean the resurrection? When Jerusalem comes down and, and the earth is remade and we're all resurrected and resurrected bodies and we reign with God in the earth? Oh, well, yeah, that's, 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 I guess we forgot about that. Yeah, we forgot about that. It's the ultimate sense of belonging. It's the ultimate sense where no longer will we ever be separated again, Period. We will not only see our loved ones when we get into the non-spiritual realm, but there will come a day in which God will recreate all of creation. We will be resurrected with a new body and we will be in that state, that being forever. We will belong. It is such a power. And the testimony to that sense of belonging is what Jesus not only inaugurated with his resurrection, but then began to manifest through his community called the church. Church, not institution per se, but a living organic community, physical community. That's why Paul does it not, Paul says of the church, the church is the ghost of Christ. What? Yeah, we're just a ghost. No, we're not. We're a body. The power of it. Um, Got to get, you know what? I didn't sneeze for four days. I sweated, but I didn't sneeze. <laughs> and I got off the plane. I went down to baggage claim. I'm like, oh, are you serious? Four times in a row. Sneeze, 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 sneeze. I'm like, okay, well, I'm bad. that's fine. It's all good. At least there's no humidity. <laughs> Rich was, uh, grew up in a Baptist church. And it's called Primitive Baptist. I wasn't familiar with it. He says, it's like, like many churches, only we have three sacraments. I said, whoa, three sacraments. What are those? Everybody has communion. 
In order to be a sacrament, you know, you know what the requirements are. We have them here. I'm ordained to administer them. I've got a card that says I'm allowed to do that. So whenever I baptize someone, I have to show my card. They, they, they have a beeper now that they look at my barcode. Beep, yeah, you're okay. You're, and then, it, no, they don't have that yet. So. The sacraments are a, a physical ritual that Jesus instituted that carries with it a promise. There you have it. Not that complicated. Physical ritual, baptism, carries with it a promise, new life. Communion. We're going to celebrate that, observe it in a, in, a, in a moment. It's a physical ritual that Jesus started. Do this in remembrance of me. It was a Passover meal, so I don't know if you want to really say that he started it, but he started it in a new manner. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. That's the only two that we have. Rich grew up in a church that had three. I asked him what it was. Foot washing. Well, let's see. Did Jesus start it? Yeah, he did. Chapter 13. Now I've given you an example. You do it. Does it have a promise? Yes. What's the promise? The promise is that you will manifest my presence among you. Lutherans kind of forgot that. How'd you, how'd you, how, how did you observe that, Rich? Every month when we had communion, we would wash one another's feet. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. We, that's too intimate. But imagine if you weren't of a church that found that icky. It would require you to really be more close and intimate with one another than anything could be offered in this world. What gives you a sense of belonging to another person? Your, your political affiliation? That you're both pissed off at the same political group? Are you recording this, by the way? You are, okay. I'm going to get a call from my mom tomorrow. Sure, mutual hatred certainly gives you a sense of belonging. It does. Mutual anger gives you a sense of belonging. Every time a country goes to war, they have to stir up mutual anger. Otherwise, you're not going to naturally just go out and kill someone. You've got to be angry at them. You're going to go to war against the Germans, then they're just a bunch of Nazis. If you're going to go to war against whatever, they're gooks. You've got to turn up mutual anger. That does give you a sense of belonging. It doesn't last, but it does give you that for at least. But what Jesus does in terms of this sense of belonging, and he turns the tables right before, it's the last thing he did, so it sticks on people's mind. They're celebrating the Passover, and before they didn't even know what he was doing. He just simply took off his outer robe, wrapped a towel, and just started washing their feet. And I thought, man, if you did that once a month, It'd be uncomfortable, but boy, would it demonstrate powerful, powerful intimacy. As a Lutheran, I suggest we get a group together and study that for a couple years. That's, that way we don't have to do anything. But it stuck with me. And in that church, it would, and, and, and that's, I think, why, I think it is a sacrament. I think we missed it. And that's for you to decide. I'm not going to suggest that we do that. God forbid we change anything. But the point being is that Jesus initiates this new community based on him and what God had anointed him to do from the creation of the world, which is to redeem it, that sense of belonging. That sense of belonging. That God, when, you, when, when that sense of belonging in Christ is realized, people will give their life for it. Because there's nothing greater than. 
So when Paul, who was killing Christians, from his standpoint of religious zealousness, was knocked over because of the glory of Christ and asked who he was, he saw it. He saw the resurrection promise of a new creation. And from there, his sense of belonging was so great, because he could already see it, that he, we still read his letters. And this is where we, in every generation, in every week, with every day, are called to live from. This resurrected sense of belonging. It, it, it transcends everything. It transcends all of the different um, categories that we try to belong in from this world. Whether it's economic, whether it's racial, whether it's political, whether it's geographical. I mean, people in Florida are just weird, right? I, I saw more people walking their dogs in Florida ever. And they're just little tiny things. No, the dogs, the people. No, the people are rather robust uh, and a lot of jewelry. And I'm like, well, this is kind of interesting. Okay, well. That's interesting. No, we're not in Minnesota anymore. But no matter where we go, God is there and God's from, from a godly viewpoint, everyone traces their origin, their, their origin story, which is why I'm moving on this project called the Genesis Project. By the way, we just received $1,000 for that project last week. I got an email. Uh, that's not happy. Oh, thank you. Traditional Lutheran, no, nothing's going to affect me. Yay, thank you, God. Thank you, thank you for supporting that ministry. And uh, we're, we're, I'll get more into that as to what that means, but this, this sense of belonging that transcends, it's what gives, it transcends our ability to, to, to figure it out. We live in a, in, a, in a constant culture where we're constantly sizing everybody up, including ourselves, to see if we belong. That's how we do it. Am I rich enough? Am I thin enough? Am I, am, I, am I too old? Am I too young? Do I have enough education? Do I live in the right place? Do I not? The whole thing. We, we went to a, we were in this bad area of town, and uh, like I said, we lived, and then there was this long strip of, I don't know what it was, I said, what is that complex? He goes, oh, that's public housing, housing. That's, that's, uh, that's welfare housing. I said, yeah, we got one of those right next to the church. Huh. Interesting. How things are placed in, in the culture. So my friends in Christ, as we go through this day, may we increase our awareness and understanding and knowing to whom we belong. We've always belonged. We've just been born into a world that has deceived us into believing that we don't. We've always belonged before the creation of the world. And may that sense of belonging that transcends our ability to figure it out give us a sense of His peace, His grace, His love, and his hope with every breath we take. Now and forever. Amen.